Yeah, so that's the, that's the tech talk back in 2012, and I want to update what we've done since then and how we think the, the hardware question beyond software is critical, important, and can learn from, from Linux as far as what, what works and what doesn't. So, that is Open Source Ecology Organization, working on open source blueprints for civilization in a nutshell. We're interested in the open source economy, so I'll talk about what we think that means. I mean, that's, that's a very broad term. We have to define the terms. And the business model that we're defining that's working for us so that we can scale, uh, just like everyone's struggling with you know, how do you make, make an open project work, we are doing that, and with some added challenges on top of that. So, first of all, a little bit about my background. So I came from Poland in 1982, so this is reality, this is not a parade, this is tanks rolling down our streets, this is communism behind the Iron Curtain, and um, my parents left to the U.S. So, but it was kind of a great time, I mean, I remember I'd have to wait in line for food, and, and just wasn't a happy time, and you think about, well, how, how is one country so powerful and great, like say America, and then there's other places that are just totally deprived and sad, so, but it, it got much better, it went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, got my PhD there, and that's where I discovered I was useless. The farther I went, I, uh, the more I was feeling irrelevant to solving, solving pressing world issues, which is why I entered science in the first place, tools for empowering humanity in, in profound ways. So that's where I just started from. So that's, that's our piece of open source hardware, that's our facility, 30 acres in Maysville, Missouri, that's in the middle of Nowhere. So we started an experiment from raw land and started to build to see what, what can happen. So we prototyped a bunch of machines, the brick presses, tractors, backhouse, sawmills, just fundamental production tools, CNC circuit mills, cement mixers, CNC torch tables, um, building up on that. At present we're about 25% done. Like there's a few projects that were pretty much far along, like we've developed a 3D printer, the tractor is pretty far up. Um, the, we started to build microhouses, uh, but I would say 25% done. So what have we learned so far? First is the fact that people can replicate this. So we, we published our blueprints on, online, and this guy is, was the first ever replicator. He, took, he downloaded our blueprints without us even knowing it, and built this machine, sent this picture to me, this was a few years ago, and first of all, I thought it was a Photoshop copy of our machine because it looks identical, but no, that's, that's digital fabrication, that's when you can you can take down with blueprints, you can CNC cut them, and you can produce them in different parts of the world. So these, these uh, people here replicated our tractor in Pasadena, California. More brick presses. This is actually a brick press operation that's in Nicaragua, that, which looks like two of our brick presses and power cubes pressing these bricks. Um, so people can replicate this. The way that this can take off and the success is you have to make this very efficient. So we've learned how to build the actual machines in a swarm modular build process in a single day. So we take a bunch of people, uh, we equip them with the tools, with very clear IKEA-like fabrication <coughs> diagrams in a process that allows parallel teams to work together and then assemble the thing rapidly into, into shape. Modular design, just like Linux has modular design. So these 12 people built that machine in one day, first, first in 20, uh, 2012, I believe that was. So we believe in radical modularity in order to do interchange of parts, uh, where a lot of our structural numbers and wheel units and other things they can interchange, uh, like the engine unit, Place it between the car, the tractor, various machines, and so forth. So once again, really focusing on the modular aspect, which allows you to build very quickly, like using this box beam, tubing, other things like the universal rotor, which can be used for big trenchers, for <laughs> soil pulverizers, and so forth. So, so a combination of the modularity, um, the modular design, reusable parts, allowed us to prototype quite fast. We took down the prototyping cycles from months to days, like for example here, you see the blue, blue machine is an iron worker. It's a machine that cuts slabs of steel that are like one inch thick. It took us six months to make that machine. 
and we thought about it, it's like, wow, that's, that's way too long. So we redesigned and just stripped it down absolutely to a thing that looks like this. And still, it, you have a nice blade in there that keeps a proper band <laughs> gap to shear steel. This thing cut 1x10 steel as well. We learned that by totally stripping down to simplicity, you can do a lot. And then you can reduce the prototyping time significantly. Just like this backhoe, which we started from design to build in two weeks. We do things according to constru the construction set approach. We use the, the common parts, which applies clearly to mechanical things, but also to various other things. How about power electronics or other designs, not just mechanical, but all areas, renewable energy, vehicle construction sets, precision machining construction sets, just about anything can be modularized in this way to create a construction set. So uh, next milestone is real-time documentation. People would, would uh, look on over the internet, we would upload pictures and videos, and we would talk on a Google Hangout, and then we would create a manual, a build manual, at the same time that the product was actually built in a workshop. So that way we could address the documentation issue, which is a big, that's a big one uh, for anyone. So now let's talk about the revenue models. What we do right now is what we call extreme manufacturing workshops, which are these swarm-based rapid builds. It's, it's an experience that people come together for, they actually pay us, so it's an, it's a, it's an experience economy, kind of an event. We both teach people and produce a valuable product during that time, such as the brick press or a house like this, where we build this in three days. That's our brick press in the back, a power cube, uh, or this. This is a 1,400 square foot seat eco home we built last year. We built that in five days. How do we do that? 50 people, open source blueprints, modular design. Every module in the system is well defined. It's like Lego blocks. You got wall units that came in one right after another. The utilities similar to that. <coughs> Um, once again, breaking it down into parallel, parallel process where different teams work on different things. So for example, day one, we built all the wall modules and actually assembled them uh, on, the, on the first day and then we go through the steps of building a house like that. Or the aquaponic greenhouse. That, this is, was another workshop. Uh, we built this thing in, in about uh, three days and that's, that's, what's in front, that's, that's where I live actually. That's my, my front yard. <laughs> Uh, those are aquaponic towers. You, there's uh, water ponds with fish underneath, and you pump water, and then grows uh, in a foam medium. Um, and it's open source. I actually can 3D print those uh, those towers, so it's digital fabrication, combining advanced tools for production. That, that's how it looks on the bottom. That's where we planted out a bunch of uh, these are actually hazelnuts, which we then pl planted out for our agriculture program. So we built 3D printers, open source hardware. The way that workshop works is 12 people. Um, I mean workshop where we build a 3D printer, we have like 12 people show up, they pay us, they take a finished 3D printer home, and that's, the, that's basically the revenue model that we use on that. So we built tractors, this is a tractor we built in a recent workshop just last year, so basically evolving, I and mean, this was a few years ago, uh, evolving to this last year. Once again, you see a modular power cube, which is just the, the engine unit, it's hydraulic, plug and play hydraulic hoses, that go to wheel motors, very modular design, um, people work in parallel. So let's talk about open source hardware. Yeah, so this is, we're one of the few projects that work on open hardware, but it's, it's really does not exist in the economy. I mean, if you look at all the companies, SparkFun, Lulzbot, there's a few of them ourselves. Uh, we're not making much money right now, but um, like 50 million, 50 to 100 million market right now. Um, that's like one one thousandth of one percent. I mean, for practical purposes, that that really doesn't exist. Compared to about four percent in software. When I say software, you can kind of say open source software, since since Linux pretty much killed it. I mean, that's, uh, the surprise for me is that I remember when I got into the open hardware movement, it was always like Linux against Microsoft, but it's like that doesn't exist, does it? <laughs> but that historically that did. Uh, Linux won the war, but what, what am I saying here that it, Linux won the battle but it lost the war? Um, well, because it seems still that even though we've got 
the great distribution of wealth from all people making money on the software, um, distribution is still an issue. So platform monopolies like Amazon or whoever uses uses open source software, uh, is it really getting better? Well, actually, if you look at the fact, well, this is the question that troubles me. That's the fact that I, I made this slide up like three years ago, and it says 85 of the world's richest people make as much money as the 3.5 billion at the bottom of the pyramid. Is that changing? Well, uh, actually, it's uh, it's actually getting worse. Like last year, it went down. So numbers are kept going. Actually, last year was eight in 2017. That's insane. But if you look at the Gini code uh, and more things, total number of billionaires. We got like they're growing. Um, about eight trillion dollars that they they have, like two thousand of them, um, so forth. But there's a very surprising thing that comes out of the the Gini coefficient. Does anyone know what that is? The Gini coefficient measures the distribution of, of wealth. Basically, zero means that there's perfect distribution. That means all the wealth in the world is divided equally among all the people. A coefficient of one is where one person has the entire wealth of the world. Uh, so it's a formula, but we're, historically it's gone from like 0.35 in the 1800s, 1988 like 0.6 or 0.7 or so. Um, but look at this, look at this data here. So about 1988, things are getting better. So, and, and this is actually a surprise for me because I was doing this, I was thinking, oh man, the world's going to crap. Um, distribution is just so skewed, all the platform monopolies are happening. Um, but things do appear to be getting better, which is great. Um, even though the wealth of the top billionaires is increasing, you don't have uh, like $5 billion billionaires, now you have like $50 billion billionaires. And the truth, still, the lower 50% of the world got 41% got poorer between 2010 and 2015. But Altogether, things seem to be doing a little better. So I actually got to look more into this. But I would say, yeah, things are getting better. Um, Linux has killed it. So what does that mean? So the economy, the economy we must say, it's improving. Like slavery was abolished in 1865. Um, things are being becoming internalized into the economy. Like for example, in 1999, natural capitalism book. You know, people start to, to say, okay, what does the capitalist system look like when we internalize environmental and social issues into the economic equation? Okay, so we can continue that, and, and what, what goes after that? How about internalizing also the distribution of wealth into the very, very system of, of our civilization? What does that look like? So, and we talk about open source software feeling, uh, and then open hardware movement, uh, open source ecology, we're working on the intersection of open source hardware, software, the physical reality that underpins civilization to, to create a system of, in which everyone's taken care of and nature, including nature and everything else, for an open source economy. So what is the open source economy? First of all, when I say hardware, I, once again, I'm not saying computers like people typically think, it's everything. It's the food you eat, the house, uh, and so forth. Um, the open source economy would mean that all the other critical infrastructures, which are actually the bigger part of the economy, also go under the framework of collaborative open source development as the norm. That means you're not no longer getting patents, like Qualcomm doesn't get a patent to, <laughs> to design its chips or whatever. A totally different paradigm, which we can't, you know, we can't hardly think about. How do you make money with that, right? How would you do that if you don't protect yourself? Um, but, but I think it will go towards a, a more collaborative economy in the future. Hardware is crucial. It's so powerful in very tangible way, ways. It's, it's, our, it's our food, housing, and things we, we use every day. So you can say that in some way, like, when we say that we live in an information economy, it's some of them misnomer because there's the hardware is underneath that. It's it's much bigger. If you want to look at some numbers, software is about two trillion in the world economy today. Hardware is about twenty-three trillion. Uh, that means things like 
mining and industry. It's about 23 million. And services economy is about 53 trillion of the entire economy, which is about 79 trillion these days. So hardware is crucial and different. It's got 10 times more impact than software. I mean, resources, which I call hardware, resources are the key, the, the underlier of things like war, poverty, corruption, government. It's all about resources. Like if you doubt that, I mean, if you study where war comes from, um, you know, some people might think, oh, it's all religious, you know, the Inquisition and stuff like that. But if you look at the number of war deaths, only 2% of historical war deaths were related to religion as the, the core idea behind that war. So, um, politics and economics is also about resources. That's why it's important. So, in, um, in the history of economic evolution, we've gone from agrarian to industrial to the, industri to the information economy. Um, I point to these numbers. So, like, mining is the first sector, according to the three-sector theory. Then there's manufacturing, and then there's the services. That's kind of the three-sector theory, which defines those sectors, which are 10, 20, and 70% of the economy. Uh, and these days, a lot of people are talking about the experience economy, that the future of the world will be, like, when we solve physical constraints, it's going to be about people, ex people's experiences. So the experience economy is the emergent form of economics that's coming about. And that's actually where we, where we operate. We, we offer experiences, emerging learning experiences. So to create the open source economy, uh, well, what is the OSC paradigm, the, the kind of platform we were talking about? It's um, open source economy, meaning no patents, all collaborative development, 100% renewable energy, byproducts are ending war poverty and corruption, transcending proprietary development, solve the distribution issue. Wow, okay, that's, that's a total paradigm change. Is there any hope for this? Um, well, we think that uh, in today's world, it's much more important to distribute the existing technology than to concentrate on developing new technology. So, so the new technology that's needed, you may say, is the tools of distribution. How do we distribute that power? Like, like some people say, uh, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. It's another way to look at it. Uh, so, so I ask myself, and, and I welcome feedback on this, is, I mean, this is all exploratory, lots of different thoughts here. Um, but the tipping point theory says, tipping point, uh, that, that the tipping point is, is about 10% of the population, meaning that if 10% of the population begin doing something, then everyone else follows. That's actually Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic University work, paper on that. Uh, it's not like the tipping point, uh, the, the book by that name, which says 20%. It's actually 10% if you look at the scientific research or more scientific research. Um, so take the 10% tipping point and the fact that according to the three-sector theory, 30% the mining and industry is 10 plus 20 percent, 30 percent. So we're saying, what is the tipping point for where uh, open hardware would go viral? So we're saying it's 10 percent of 30 percent, um, and we're also saying that it matters what people do, like your job. Who, what are you doing for a living? That's how you will affect people's lives in a fundamental way. Um, what people do creates the economy. Therefore, we're saying. Um, if those people in those two sectors reach the tipping point, you have to look at the salaries within that sector. So I'm trying to calculate from the $79 trillion, what's the tipping point? So I'm saying, well, about 40 or so percent of the GDP is salaries. So we're taking 10% of 30% of 31 trillion. And that comes out to about 940 billion, which is about a trillion. Uh, so, we're, so we're saying that is the point at which if open hardware got to that scale of activity within the economy, it would all follow that we might um, have collaborative development and open source economy actually take place. So that's, you know, that's just trying to add some numbers to that. Um, so the point is, it's a, it's a, what we're trying to do is take the non-existent open source economy and, and convert it to about 1.3% open hardware in the entire economic sector. Um, which we think, hey, that might be doable. Let's try this. So we, we define what's known as distributed enterprise. I wrote a paper on this in the MIT Innovations Journal. It's about, it's a model where the essential model is the fact that whatever economic information you're producing, you are distributing that. You are training others 
to compete with you because uh, that's a truly collaborative way. Like no barriers to uh, basically no no competitive waste. Um, the blueprints that we make both for the, the the products and the enterprises around those products are distributed. Uh, so what is what does that model look like? Uh, certainly you have to avoid the freeloader dilemma and we're trying to do this in a bootstrap way. So what are we doing here? Um, following the Linux model, we go about developing open source hardware products. Modular project architecture in Linux means also modular project arch architecture for open source ecology for developing. So we break down all our technology into many modules and develop them. So a highly modular process. Uh, it can be parallelized, and but then you, you also need more than just a computer. You, you need a compiler, the open source microfactory, the thing that turns your blueprints into products. Um, that's a big, big missing link. But that's part. Of the open source microfactory is part of the work that we're developing to be able to translate the blueprints into real, real objects. But the the deal is, uh, we're really asking the question: What? can provide the most benefit to people um, in a distributive approach. It's, it's really about freedom. I mean, that, you know, everyone talks about freedom. What is the most efficient economic system that can provide it? How can we get to the point where the economic system is no longer standing in a, in a way of pursuit of what people really want to do? Like job satisfaction in the United States is not high, like more than 50% of the people are not happy with their jobs. Like why is that? You know, can we make, make the economy work a little better? So that's, that's what we're asking. Uh, so we're saying, okay, let's develop in parallel, massive parallel business development. Um, we're proposing, we kind of call it the open source everything store, the idea that people are collaborating openly and we're producing products that Essentially, like like Amazon, the open source, of the, the the everything store. Um, how about developing those products collaboratively, and then those products can be produced locally in open source microfactories, so that you have a global effect of localization, relocalization, where people can do much more with advanced technology and advanced product design within their local communities. That's the idea. Um, to re its idea is to reduce the, the workday and put the pursuit of self-determination as the, the core principle of what people are pursuing in their life. So it's not about technological change as much as social change. Um, so the critical thing is how do you create financial feedback loops in this kind of a program? Uh, Linux did it. We do it with uh, brick and mortar digital enterprises. These are actually real bricks that we produce from the brick press. Uh, so we build real things, uh, but what is the competitive advantage? You know, is that even the right question to ask? Um, we're saying that the concept of competitive advantage may, you know, it, it applies in some way, but if we're talking about all those things in society that right now, um, other producers are making, we really question the very nature of what, what does competitive advantage mean for for the open source economy. Uh, it's not, you know, how how can you how can you make a living when all this everyone has access to to the goods? Uh, big question. I mean, we, we think that very uh, the competitive advantage is the fact that we're relocalizing production, that the wealth is being generated more and more closely to people in communities and therefore that has a competitive advantage built into that. It's a really efficient system that eliminates the disinter and disintermediates a lot of middle people. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, let's see where to where to go from here. The idea is that the the products that we talk about are very common, mundane, everyday things, and the market for them is huge. Um, but let's talk about the, so let's, I mean, that's, that's a lot of theory there, but let's talk about the specific things we do. So when we build things like houses here, we have to, we have to design the workflows very carefully for a large team of people. We think that this kind of model of experiential economy can, can be used to produce many, many things. Uh, but it takes a lot of work to, 
develop that. And uh, it's about creating space. So what do we do? So the model that we use is simply a combination of education, production, and training. So when we host one of these workshops, we're charging basically like uh, like a hundred bucks per person per day to do this. So to you know to give you an example, the revenue milestones we have already achieved. So for building of the C Eco Home, we were able to generate twenty five thousand from this five day workshop just from the tuition. So think about that. So that's that's pretty good. If we have a client, like the, the model that we're looking at, this is what we're trying to scale right now, is that house itself right here costs 30,000 materials. Uh, it's all open source design. We build it in five days. We can sell something like that very easily. I mean, like we, we find a client, 70,000, let's say. So uh, because the market value of a house like that, it's, it's going to be at the very, very least. I mean, we're in the middle of nowhere in Missouri. That's, houses like that would be like 160,000 there. Uh, elsewhere, it's probably more like a quarter million, I mean, 250,000. The average house cost for like a 2,000 square foot house is about $350,000 in the United States. So there's definitely a business case for this. Uh, and that's, that's what we're trying to make go. We, um, uh, we don't have to pay for labor, actually, the labor actually pays us, so we're reversing that equation. We're training people to, to do that production. Uh, we do real products. And the question there becomes, okay, uh, how do you do such distributed quality control of the whole process? Well, there have to be checklists and guides and people guiding that build event that can assure that everything goes up to spec. And, and here, um, this is our experimental house. I mean, we're very happy with it. I um, mean, it's, it's actually off grid. It's got PV on it. You actually have a biodigester in it, hydronic heating. Um, the greenhouse, that's a separate thing. That was built in another five days. Um, but you get the idea. So another revenue milestone is we build a brick press, a machine that is used to build the, to press out the bricks, a stabilized block that's waterproof that you can build houses with, a, a good building material. In a workshop like that, we build the machine. Um, typically, we do it in a three-day workshop, and we can do it in one day. But we like to give the full education experience. Ten thousand dollars, so about five thousand comes from tuition. And then we sell the machine, so we get another 5000 on top of the materials. So $10,000 for a three-day workshop. That's, that's how it works. And there we leverage digital fabrication. We use a CNC torch table to cut this out from digital blueprints. 